you've got one file that's basically both of these talks together. It's got um, many slides in it. And uh, my normal speaking rate is kind of 80, 90 slides an hour. I've got kind of two hours to talk with you and there's more slides than that. So I'm gonna, there are times when I'm gonna skip over some of those to keep us on track. So at the end of this lecture, um, I really would like you to know a little bit of the basic history of CT, although I'm going to cut out some of that uh, in lieu of getting to some of the more salient points, uh, especially for kind of exam preparation. I want you to have a, a feeling for how reconstruction is performed. I want you to know some of the basics of the imaging parameters, uh, know some of the display information there. So let's just talk a little bit about tomography, right? Tomography really literally means slice imaging. Um, and really the idea here is we want to go from the planar x-rays uh, that were talked about here to these slice type images that were talked about, to what we were, we were uh, talking about when we talk about CT. You know, what were the limitations of those images back then? You know, I had a really poor quality x-ray tube, really poor quality film, no good collimation, scatter suppression, and all those things. So if you really look at the early history of x-ray imaging after 1895, a lot of it was devoted to kind of improving some of those things. But you know, even after that stuff was done, you still have the issue that on a planar radiograph, those 3D structures are all superimposed into a 2D image. So people really started to try and work on ways to minimize that effect. And this picture should look very familiar to you, right? Because I showed you a picture that looked like this when we talked about tomosynthesis. And right, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because we were doing, quote unquote, tomosynthesis or conventional tomography going back 80 years ago. Basically, we rotated the x-ray tube and the film in concert with each other. And what you got was a single plane that was in better focus and the planes above and below that out of focus. Unlike today's digital technology, if I wanted a different depth of plane, I had to repeat the, po the process all over again using a slightly different fulcrum point. But what's nice with digital is we can do it one time and then just change the amount of shifting in the images when we add them together to get the different planes. So when I started residency back in 2001, 2002, we used to do a lot of intravenous pilograms, right? So we would take an image of the patient, we'd kind of guess how deep the kidneys were in the bottom, we'd do a tomogram, okay? You can think of tomosynthesis uh, with a piece of film, and we'd look at that and say, yeah, the kidneys were at about the depth of the kidneys there, go ahead and give them their contrast, and then we'd do our tomogram again to show that out. So, these are some slice images, some conventional tomography type images that were done uh, before CT. How many people have a Panorex unit where they are? Another type of conventional tomography, right, where we rotate the x-ray tube and the imaging acquisition device together to get this image that has the plane of the mandible in good focus, the curved surface of that mandible, and the tissues deeper to that and superficial to that a little bit more out of focus. And of course, we also mentioned breast tomosynthesis. So those are types of kind of conventional tomography. In the early 60s, people started to think about, well, is, is there a way to do something better than to just, you know, have this limited arc and blur structures out? They're still there kind of in the way, even if they're blurred out a little bit better. And people really started to think about the mathematics of how to do that, how to reconstruct a cross-section of the image. And I want to introduce you to the concept of simple back projection, which was the first idea to do that. So imagine you have a, a round object, like a, let's say a cylinder, and you do a projection of that. So here's that projection, you know, it's like a, a line in an x-ray, if, if you will. And notice it's brighter in the center because the x-rays had to travel through a little bit thicker material and therefore were more attenuated and decreased on the edges. Well, now imagine if you took the projection image of that, the x-ray image of that, in this direction, and you also took it in this direction. Well, if I wanted to reconstruct a slice through that object, why don't I take this profile that I got here, remember, which is a little brighter in the center and drops off at the edges, and smear that back along the direction the x-ray was obtained. 
And then I'll do that for this projection as well. And we get some picture that looks like this. And it doesn't really look anything like the original object. But, but let's take four projections. Now instead of getting one to a pair 90 degrees apart, let's get one at uh, 45 degrees and then one over here at 135 degrees. And let's do that simple smearing back along the direction in which that occurred. Again, not looking a whole lot like the original object, but a little bit more so. And if we do that for more and more projections, notice when we get up to 32 or so projections here, we're starting to get something that looks a lot like that original object. Unfortunately, it still has this blurring in the background that decreases the contrast in this slice image here. This is the notion of simple back projection. I want to apply it to a couple of objects so you get a better idea, something that's a little bit more complicated than that simple little round object that I showed you. Here's a mathematical phantom that's sometimes used to represent the brain. So imagine if we're taking a projection in this direction, right? And then that's the line of data that's represented here. And you'll notice this goes from zero to 180 degrees with one degree increment. So those are the, each line is the projection that you would take at each one of those degree increments. So here's the zero projection in that direction. When you get out here to where it's 90 degrees, that's the projection that's obtained in that direction. Now if you take each of those lines and you smear them back across a slice, right, smear them back, you get something that looks like that. Again, it looks like a very blurred version of that Shep Logan phantom. And that's the simple back projection. And again, the main problem with the simple back projection is that decrease in the contrast because of the fact that when we smear this back along the entire direction, it actually ends up putting stuff out here in the background where there's absolutely nothing in, in, the, in the true representation of the object. So how, how do we correct for that, right? Simple back projection basically produces a blurred image, a blurred slice image of the true object. And if we can understand the mathematical process behind the blurring, right, if we, we can correct for the blurring, and that's exactly what filtering does. Filtering is the correction that's applied so that when you do the back projection, the image turns out looking correct. So filtered back projection. We filter those projections and then we do the same thing. We just do that back projection of them uh, like we do. So let's look at that. So remember, here was that simple back projection. We had that original object that looked a little blurry. It turns out that the filtering means that we multiply this guy times, um, its, or at least its frequency don represent, domain representation, and I won't get into that, but by this thing called a filter. And it changes the way that that object looks. Here's what the profile through that object looked like originally, right? We talked about the fact that it was most dense, if you will, in this region, so that's the highest peak, and then dropped off towards the edges. When you multiply that by the filter or apply the filter, convolve it with its filter if you want to be more mathematically correct, it ends up looking like this. Notice these negative side lobes on the edge of the object. That ends up canceling out that background stuff that we had that we knew shouldn't be there, okay? So that's, that's the object of that. So here is the filtered back projection with two projections. And if you notice with two projections, you probably would say to yourself, this sucks worse than the simple back projection, right? And it's really not until you get up to 64 projections or so that you notice you get a much sharper version of your original object, but it, it is in the background of a little bit of kind of uh, reconstruction noise. If you took this out to 128, 256, the mathematics behind the filtered back projection actually assumes that there, if you will, there is an infinite number of these projections to do that. So there's a little bit of artifact from that. So compare the filtered back projection to that simple back projected object. So that's what I want you to understand in terms of conceptually happening. That data that the CT scan acquires, those are the projections. And then we're going to take those and we're going to mathematically apply this filtering to them and then do the back projection. And that's going to give us our reconstruction for filtered back projection. Here's that Shep Logan phantom. Here's that, those projections, it's a, something called the sinogram, and here's that simple back projected object, and here's the filtered back projection version of that. And there's actually a couple here, because it turns out you can actually do filtering 
of the projections and then back project. So that's filtered back projection. But if you want, you can back project first and then filter. So you can do back projection filtering, but that typically isn't what's done. And it's just showing two examples of those. I wanted to give you a, a real, little bit more of a real world example, right? So here is an original CT slice. So now if we theoretically were to take that and make our projection data and do a simple back projection of that, that's what the object would look like, right? You can tell maybe it's a slice of the body and you can see the vert vertebral body and some of the ribs there, but not much. And here it is, the filtered back projection image from that. And you can tell this was, must have been a, um, you know, a uh, mathematician or a physicist or someone who did this, right? Because they didn't care how they displayed the image. This patient's uh, got their spine, right, uh, anteriorly there. But it just conceptually gives you the idea between what simple back projection and filtered back projection are. Now, we're moving more and more to iterative reconstruction techniques away from filtered back projection. And the main reason for that is we can actually model the image formation process a little bit better and therefore do a little bit better handling of noise and those kind of things. And you may ask, well, why didn't we do that before, you know, the last five years or so? And the reason is that's computationally an extremely complex problem. Um, it, is, it takes a tremendous amount of computing power. The theoretic mathematics behind it aren't as complex as they are for filtered back projection, but the computational power that you need in terms of a computer to perform this are much more, uh, you need much more computational power. So I want you to think of your image as just being an array of, of values in a grid here. And of course the grid is much finer than I've even described here, 512 by 512 typically in CT. But in some ways, we can really think of this as a problem of, you know, multiple equations with unknowns, and we just need to solve those multiple equations. And I want to show you just briefly what I mean by that by doing our little four pixel example here, right? It's not going to be a very interesting problem with four pixels, but I think conceptually it will give you an idea, right? What do we do? We shine radiation of a known value across our object, which here I've drawn consisting of four pixels. We're only going to solve for it in terms of four pixels. And the amount of radiation that's going to pass through these two pixels and then hit our detector so I can measure the amount of uh, radiation that's incident on the detector. So I know how much was here and I know how much was there. I also know how wide these pixels are. And by the way, I could do a similar thing here. Incident radiation, which is probably the same as that amount, but the amount I detect may be a little different because these attenuation values here in this second row may be slightly different. So let's write an equation just for this top x-ray beam coming through when we detect it. So the amount that I detect is equal to the amount that comes in initially times e to the minus the thickness of the pixels and then those linear attenuation values, right? Remember, we talked about the fact that the X-ray beam intensity decays exponentially and the decay constants are the linear attenuation values. And these are the things that I want to plot. I want to make a picture of mu11 and mu12. So if you just take the log of both sides of those, I can now convert that to the log of these two values. That's just a number, right? Because we know both of those quantities. And that equals this guy in terms of our two unknowns. So I'm going to change this. I know this looks a little messy here, right? So let's just call that some constant because it's really a value that we can calculate knowing the intensity going in and the intensity detected. So all I have is that C11 equals these two things. Well, I've got a known value here, and it equals the sum of those two unknown quantities. Right? Does everyone see that I could write a very similar equation for here? Right? I could write a very similar equation here. And then if I wanted to, so there's that other equation. If I wanted to, I could then rotate you know, 90 degrees and do the same exact thing again and get another equation here and another equation here. And very simply, right, I have four equations, four linear equations in four unknowns. And we all remember back to our algebra class where we had two equations and two unknowns and we had to solve them and we thought that that sucked. And then our teacher asked us to do three equations and three unknowns and we thought that sucked a lot more. And then they maybe taught us Kramer's rule or something to use matrices to try and sim simplify that. But, but um, 
you know, so this is a system of linear equations and unknowns. I mean, what's so hard about that? Yes, if you did it by hand, it's hard, but just put a, a computer to work on that. Each 512 by 512 CT slice contains 262,144 unknowns. Okay. Modern CT scanners acquire approximately 1,000 projections, right? Not just the two that I talked about to find our four unknowns, right? 1,000 projections. And there's about 750 detectors in a single row on the CT scanner, right? So I've got 1,000 times 750. That's 750,000 equations. Fortunately, I have more equations than unknowns, right? So, so I can solve that problem. But because of noise, those equations aren't even consistent with each other, right? So this is a tremendously challenging pro problem in terms of reconstruction, in terms of the computational power it takes. So what does iterative reconstruction do? It doesn't quite do exactly what we just talked about by solving those as a system of unknowns. Instead, it kind of says, well, what should the image look like? Let me use a guess to do that. Some, sometimes it actually uses something like filtered back projection as its initial guess. And it says, well, then let me take that guess of what the image should look like and let me compute what its projections would look like. What would the data on the detectors of the CT scanner look like if that was what the, Im the object looked like? And then it can compare those to the projection data that you got and look for what the difference is between those. And it can then use that difference to correct your estimation of the object. So basically, I went through all of this, but what I'm really saying is it says, well, let me start off with a guess of the image, and then I'm gonna calculate a correction factor, and I'm gonna correct that guess to give me a new image, and then I'll repeat this process. Well, how much does my new image match with the projection data. And if it doesn't, I'll cal calculate a correction factor and I'll update that image. And I'll continue to do this until my difference between my estimated projections from my image and the projections we measured is below some certain level. Okay, that's iterative reconstruction. Unfortunately, there's many variables that must be chosen as part of an iterative reconstruction. You know, how do we calculate that correction factor I kind of glossed over? When do you stop? How many iterations do you do before you stop? How do you use those projections to update the data? A lot of those things. And because of that, um, there are a lot of iterative reconstruction algorithms out there. You know, every manufacturer's filtered back projection algorithm basically does the same thing that, that I talked about. You can use slightly different filters, but their algorithm does the same thing. The iteratives are much more variable, so they're a little harder to talk about. We first used iterative reconstruction in nuclear medicine. Here, here's a, um, a cardiac study with really everything opened up so you can see the entire uh, uh, chest. Um, in this uh, woman. Um, but here's the number of iterations. One iteration, two, five, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100, 150. And you can see that as you continue to iterate, the data tends to get noisier and noisier. You tend to amplify noise as you iterate more and more. So you've got to know, you know, how do you pick your stopping point for this iteration process this is another important question as well. And oftentimes I'll ask people when I show this, you know, tell me, hey, which one of these images do you think is the best? And there'll be, there'll be quite a bit of variation. You know, some people will say we should stop at 10. Other people will say we should stop at 20. But people usually mostly pick something that's in that middle row, though. So I said, told you that this is computationally much more demanding than filtered back projection. So then why are we using it? Well, because it has some certain advantages, right? It allows us to better model the physics of the projection back projection process. It allows us to better handle noise. Um, we can model some of the blurring uh, in the detector, uh, some of the resolution blurring there. Uh, we can better model the physics of that projector and back projector, and we can better handle some of the processes that actually occur, but filtered back projection assumes don't occur, like beam hardening and photon starvation and those kind of things. So 
iterative reconstruction here to stay. How many people in the room are using iterative reconstruction as part of their, uh, they've got, switched away from filtered back projection and all their body CTs are now being reconstructed iter iteratively. So we've got a, a few hands in the audience. My guess is if I ask that next year and the subsequent year, those percentages of hands are just gonna continue to go up. So we did a little brief historical introduction to tomography and its use in medical imaging. Um, I wanted to introduce for you so that you have kind of just a, a feeling for what simple back projection is and of course what filtered back projection is on top of that. And then kind of a, an idea of what iterative reconstruction is on top of that. So I, I would, next I really want to talk about the equipment. I want to talk about modern CT scanners and some of their components. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the generations of scanners, just really uh, to the point where they really get us to where we are today, if you will. We're going to go over some of the imaging parameters and the effects that they have on the type quality image that we get. And, um, you know, understand a little bit about some of the modes of the scanner, including our um, topogram or, or a scout acquisition, operating in sequence mode, operating in helical or spiral mode, uh, fixed MA, dynamic MA, and fluoroscopic modes, if you will. So some major components, right? We've got that computer and we've really got that scanner. And so when we look in, here's that scanner. And a lot of times in a lot of setups, you'll often have two computers there. One will be kind of the acquisition computer that can do some basic reconstruction work. And then sitting next to that will be a workstation which can do some higher end work, some, perhaps some of your 3D uh, type display work. Although more and more, this is all coming packaged together in a single unit. You can use the, the acquisition CPU to do some of your 3D processing as well. If you take the housing off the CT scanner, this is what it looks like. Now, you can see this is the thing right here that's rotating around the patient, right? If you took the housing off and let it rotate at the three times revolutions a second that it rotates, there is no way any patient would lay down on the CT scanner, right? I mean, um, so the housing serves a very important role, right? Um, it requires a lot of power, right? CT scanner has a power consumption of about 200 kilowatts, and that power must be transmitted to this device rotating at three revolutions a second. That's where we are today, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we got there, because in a lot of ways, that's an engineering phenomenon in and of itself. Here's that power supply. You can see the big cables there coming into that power supply. We've got to have an x-ray tube um, that really can absorb a tremendous amount of heat and still func function well. I mean, now we get these multi-phase studies and we cover you know, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Uh, you really, your tube has to be able to tolerate a tremendous amount of heating. And unfortunately, the engineers have done a wonderful job there. I mean, I can remember from my first day starting as a resident where we actually had to not use the CT scanner for a few minutes while the tube kind of cooled down. Now with these modern tubes, right, basically you could put a conveyor belt going into the CT scanner. I know sometimes in the emergency room it, it seems like that is what they're do doing. So there's that x-ray tube, and everyone sees the little window here that the x-rays are actually going to come out of. And so we've got that rotating cathode now, and notice that this is that evacuated tube, and we actually rotate the vacuum now. The seal here is so good, and we can pump in cooling oil to really keep this cool to prevent that heat damage from, from occurring. We use a little bit of added filtration in CT. Remember, part of the reason we lost contrast in X-ray imaging is because all the 3D structures were projected over each other. In CT, we're going to improve our contrast just by the fact that we're no longer going to have those superposition of 3D structures into a 2D plane. So we can actually get away with a little higher KV, right, and not get quite as much photoelectric effect there. Um, we try to still shape the beam a little bit, try to get a little bit more of a monochromatic peak to it, um, but, uh, you know, of course, you, we can only do that to a limited degree. One thing that's unique in CT is a bow tie filter that really helps shape the beam um, 
in terms of the, the quantity of that x-ray beam. It, of course, has a little bit of effect on quality as well as any filtration does. But it gives us a more uniform distribution of a noise in the patient, and frankly, it decreases the dose to the patient and reduces a bit of scatter. So I want to make sure that you, you guys understand that a little bit. I've, I think I've drawn this picture enough where we show that filtration kind of shapes that beam the way we, we would like it, and we tend to fil do a little uh, harder filtration in CT than we do in X-ray imaging. But because the body is either oval in shape or if you're scanning the head round in shape and frankly some of us are a little bit more round than oval. Um, you know if you take a look at the intensity of the x-ray beam as it exits the patient, x-rays up in this region have to travel through less tissue than x-rays through this tissue. So the number of x-rays, the, right, the intensity, the quantity of the x-ray beam is less here centrally than it is going to be up here just because of that. The beam here is going to be a little harder, so the average X-ray energy is going to be greater, but there's going to be fewer number of X-rays there. And that ends up with giving you a kind of an odd distribution of noise when you reconstruct uh, uh, the image. And so instead we apply this bow tie filter. And notice what that bow tie filter does is it filters out some of the lower energy X-rays to towards the end there, and now our central, um, and sorry, and then our we get fewer x-rays here, more towards the center where the filter is thinner, so that the net effect after it goes through the body is a more even distribution in terms of the number of x-rays. So that's the purpose of the bow tie filtering, one of the special types of filtration that we do in CT imaging. We also do a little bit of collimation, just like we would collimate in um, when we wanted to see something in, in fluoroscopy. Uh, this also shapes the beam a little bit. It turns out you can collimate in either the z-axis or the x-y-axis. You can do it pre or post-patient. Um, if you do it post-patient, you help eliminate some of the scatter hitting the detector, and that's uh, important if, uh, um, in some certain types of imaging. And the pre-patient co co collimation really reduces dose to the patient. So if you think about it, we'd really like to bring these pre-patient collimators in. You know, if our detector was only this wide, it, we should bring the pre-patient collimators in so that our x-ray beam is no wider than the detectors. It makes no sense to be irradiating parts of the patient that radiation isn't going, if that radiation isn't going to strike onto the detector there. And then we can bring these post-patient ones in sometimes, and that will eliminate some of the scattered radiation that might have been out of the primary beam field from actually striking the detector. The detectors are really the, the most expensive single component of a CT scanner, and there are a lot of different types. We mentioned some of the types, uh, older detectors, the old uh, volume zoom, and there's some of those, that four-row uh, Siemens detector still in use, used a xenon gas-filled detector. Most current uh, use, use a scintillating material, so you've got a, a crystal that scintillates, and then you've got a diode underneath that detects the intensity of the light that's given off, and it knows, it can calibrate that to the intensity of the x-ray beam that made it through at that point. Um, solid state detectors are in the development and so are some photon counting detectors. Remember those two things that we looked at when we talked about direct digital imaging in, uh, fluor um, in uh, radiography are also being developed for use in CT. And gas detectors, we've seen this image a number of times, very simple, x-ray comes in, uh, liberates uh, some electrons from the gas that fills that tube and those depart. And these detectors in the CT scanner are filled with xenon, right? You'd, we'd like to fill these with a high Z gas. So high Z, so we maximize the chance of them interacting. And we'd like to put them under pressure so we can increase the density of the gas that's in there and maximize the chance of interaction as well. And I've shown you guys a number of scintillators where that X-ray photon comes in and hits this, and then we have our light detection electronics underneath that. Let's talk a little bit about some of the generations of CT scanners, and I'm going to go through some of these fairly briefly and spend a little bit more time on others. So the first scanner, when uh, Sir Godfrey Hounfield made his first scanner, it had a parallel ray geometry. You, you basically had a pencil beam of X-ray, so a single X-ray beam, if you will, um, and it went in that uh, single X-ray beam, shined a line through your object, and hit this detector, and that intensity was measured. 
And then it translated over a little bit and it repeated that process. So we measured a single line of projection data, just a single line at a time. And then once we translated all the way through, we rotated and did that again, right? So this is like me showing you those simple uh, back projection images, right? Only it takes forever to get each one of these images. 4.5 minutes to scan one slice. And that's only getting 160 rays in each slice and going one degree apart before we repeat it. And the reconstruction took about a minute and a half. So we did this translate to acquire each line, rotate, and then start the process all over again. And there's his setup. The funny thing was he actually had a detector sitting below this one in the Z direction. So the first scanner was, if you will, a multi-row detector scanner, right, um, consisting of two rows. So the second generation simplified the problem by saying, hey, let's have, rather than a pencil beam, let's have a fan beam of a small number of rays, four or five of them or so, and that'll decrease the number of translations that we need to do. Now, some people thought, well, that's a little bit problematic in that each of these is now, now traveling straight across. It's at a slight angle. But it turns out if you limit that to just a few, four or five or so, the approximation that they were about the same as the parallel lines that we would get in the translation is close enough that this still works out very nicely. And using this, notice they were able to speed things up a little bit, right? Now we could do about 18 seconds to scan one slice or so. So in the third generation, we got rid of that translation need, right? We increased the number of detectors to around the 750, 800 that it is today. They're all located on a kind of a curved surface in kind of a fan configuration. It's enough to kind of give you the, the entire patient can be included in the field of view. And then we joined the tube and the detector together mechanically, so now we could just basically rotate. There was no need for the translation motion. All the mathematics that had been described, de developed, to do reconstruction using filtered back projection assumed that the acquired projections were parallel to each other. But now, does everyone see, right, we're acquiring this broad fan-type projection. And so one of the things that had to happen in order to to go from this parallel beam projection process, which was quite slow, to this fan beam acquisition, was the realization that you had the same data sets. It's just that they were organized completely differently. And I want to show that to you by showing you this picture. Does everyone see, here I've got two positions where we've done our fan beam acquisition, a few degrees apart from us. We've rotated over a little bit here to get the one that I've labeled in blue compared to yellow. Now I'm going to start to subtract some of the rays from this, some of the projection lines away from both of these, okay? So let's start to subtract some of those out. And does everyone see that there are a pair of lines in these two projections which are parallel to each other? And if you rotate entirely around the, the body, if I did this at a third spot and color-coded that red, I could keep one of my red lines, which was parallel to these ones. And if I did that at the next position, there would be. And so really all you needed to do was take the fan data and do what we call re-bin it, resort it, into all the rays that were parallel to each other and do, then do your filtered back projection on that. So it took that kind of leap of faith. And really, this is what our modern scanners do with one exception. At some point, we decided we were gonna move the X-ray table while we were rotating. We were gonna go to a helical acquisition or a spiral acquisition. But before that happened, a couple of other things were introduced. Here was the fourth generation CT. You just made a complete row of detectors. Um, this is nice because when I showed you that rotating gantry, uh, you know, the detector and the x-ray tube in combination that are rotating, they're way over 2,000 pounds. We certainly don't tell the patient that when we, you know, put them in the, the bore of the scanner and rotate it three times a second, right? So if I no longer have to rotate the detector and can just rotate the tube, 
I actually can actually get the speed of that rotation a bit higher. I've got less mass that I'm having to rotate around. But what did I tell you about the detectors? They're the most expensive part of the CT scanner, right? So the problem with this is rather than having 72 degrees of detectors, you've now got 360 degrees of detectors you have to pay for. So that kind of fell by the wayside. Here was the fifth generation of scanners. This was um, electron beam tomography, where now I bring my electrons in and I actually fire them uh, to strike these targeting rings, and I can steer them. These targeting rings actually go around the patient 180 degrees, and I can steer my electrons to go hit them at different points. So now in electron beam tomography, I didn't even have to rotate an X-ray tube around the patient. And this was popular for a while in kind of the mid-90s because you could do a very fast acquisition with this. So for cardiac imaging, it was really the first scanner that was utilized for doing that. But again, it's extremely expensive. And so this really got replaced with this sixth generation of CT, helical or spiral CT. Um, you know, those previous scanners operated in sequence mode. In other words, the X-ray tube and detector rotated 360 degrees around the patient, then they stopped. The table shifted forward a small increment, then they rotated back the other direction. Table shifted forward again, they rotated in the other direction and continued to do that. And part of the reason for that was you had these really heavy duty power cables connecting to the x-ray tube and connecting to the detectors, although those don't have to be the same kind of power requirements. And so you couldn't continue to just rotate the tube in one direction. If you did, you'd wind those cables up and, and rip them apart. So someone had to come up with a way to allow that to continuously spin, but still maintain high quality, high power electrical connections with those devices. And that's the slip ring technology uh, that we see today. So here's the old right, just continue to rotate and move the table forward, which is what the tube did. It only did that on the older versions, right? Rotated 360, then the table shifted in an increment. Now we're gonna move the table continuously while the tube continues to rotate. And we end up getting, tracing this kind of helical path, if you will, of X-ray energy through the patient. Here's that technology that had to, to exist in order to make that happen. Does everyone see this big center cylinder of metal that's here? And these are the electrical connections. They're actually little pads that fit in these grooves here. And I'm gonna show you those up close. He, well, here it is up close. And here is stepping further back away from that. So these are all the electrical contacts that are made through there. And they're made with this device. It, you can see that this, um, it, this is almost like a, uh, a coil spring, right, uh, um, uh, that you might see on, a, uh, on an old uh, car suspension, right? And so it forces them up to main con maintain contact with those rings. So that slip ring technology allowed you to maintain contact with that moving portion of the scanner without having cables con directly connected to it. The seventh generation just now added multiple rows to the detectors, right? We first ended up had single row helical scanners. Now we started to look at multi-row detector helical scanners. Um, and, you know, there are some more issues. We talked about the interpolation problems with fan beam. Now we've got helical scanners, so we're not the data that we acquire isn't all exactly in that one slice like it would be for the sequence acquisition, right? And so you can't move the table as fast as you might like to move it. If you move it too fast, your reconstruction quality is gonna suffer from that. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about the concept of pitch. But when we added multiple rows to the scanner, it allowed us to travel the Z distance that we traveled per one rotation of the scanner got greater. And so we could scan through the patients even quicker with that uh, generation. So here we are looking, we've got our individual detectors in any one given row. I've already mentioned the fact there's about 750 of these that span a 72 degree arc. 
And then the first scanners started out with two rows and then quickly we went to four and then this is happening while I was a resident in the early 2000s. So the next thing I know we have a 16 row detector scanner and the next thing I know we have a 64 row detector scanner and then a 128 and um, you know now there are scanners, uh, gosh, that have, have, have many more than that. So here's the Siemens volume zoom, the four row detector scanner that was out at the time. You could actually combine these rows in all sorts of different ways. But once you went to scanners that had you know, multiple rows in the 64s, the 256s, the 320s, um, all of those detector rows really became equal in width because re, um, you know, having them be variable widths really didn't make a whole lot of sense anymore. So this is the, the range that they cover along that z-axis. So if you have a 128 row detector and each of the um, rows is, or let's go with a 64 row detector and each of the rows is 0.6 millimeters, that's that Z coverage of those rows is a couple of centimeters or so. So it's still not a lot, right? It's a, a one inch band uh, craniocaudal on the patient that we're covering with that. Um, cone beam CT tries to extend that, right, to really now make the coverage in the Z axis about as wide, as it, if you will, as it is in the X and Y axis. Um, here that is, right, instead of getting this one detector row or maybe there's, you know, 32 or 64 of those, now we frankly have like a huge flat panel detector and we just are rotating that around the patient. This, this brings about some additional interesting reconstruction problems. The mathematics of some of the reconstructions become more complicated when we do this, and I don't want to get into that here, but towards the ends of this cone beam where the data is angled quite a bit more as it, than it is towards the center, you end up not sampling the tissues quite the same, and so there's some, some issues that you have to work with in terms of the, the reconstruction. And you can see that here, right? Here's the central slice. You know, if you only have three or four rows, or maybe if you're even only covering, what, what did we say, one inch or a couple of inches in the Z direction, this off-axis angulation of the acquisition planes is not really that severe. But as you try to go to maybe 30 centimeters in that plane, it becomes uh, quite a, a bit of uh, angled plane acquisition. The, the next generation, although frankly people stopped calling these different generations basically at about this point, was the dual source scanner where we had two separate x-ray tubes. And you could really use this dual source configuration to do some very different things. If you wanted to, you could apply the same KV to both x-ray tubes and really just rotate this thing, well, move your table even faster because notice you'd have two pieces of detector material here. So instead of sampling 72 degrees. Turns out they're not both 72 degrees. The one detector is a little smaller than the other. I'm actually sampling a greater arc of data, so that allows me to, with each revolution, so now I can move the patient through even faster. So one thing is you can use that for speed. And in cardiac imaging, in fact, that's what we do. The dual source scanner really becomes the cardiac imaging workhorse in a lot of places. But another thing you can do is set them at different KV and use some of that differential attenuation information we talked about uh, tissues, right, that tissues attenuation is different, different x-ray energies, and we can use that to do material comp decomposition. Um, so some we use for speed, that gives us really nice, um, you know, multiplanar uh, curve, multiplanar reformats for doing stuff like looking cardiac vessels. Here's a study for renal stone where, you know, this, the, this uh, uric acid stones are color-coded red because based on the two different KVs on the x-ray tube and knowing what the Hounsfield unit measure for each pixels are on that two data sets, we can figure out what pixels are composed of calcium and which ones are composed of uric acid. We do the very similar thing in gout imaging in MSK, only for whatever reason in MSK we, co we color code uric acid green while Siemens set up co color codes it red on their, uh, you know, uh, renal stone dual energy uh, protocol thing, but it's really doing the same thing. It's, it's asking where, where do those paired Hounsfield units at the two energies fall and using that to type what type of material you have. 
So let's talk some about some of our imaging parameters now that we have under our control and how we're going to utilize them in the setting of modern CT scanners uh, to do that. And I really, with the setting of modern CT scanners, I think probably most of us in the room are most familiar with having a uh, seventh generation scanner, right? A multi-row detector uh, helical acquisition scanner. So what I'm going to talk about is really going to be most applicable to that. So the, the first thing that we need to decide is, right, when we acquire our data set, since we have this helical acquisition, I can actually ask for a slice to be reconstructed at any particular position I would like in the body. I can ask you to make a slice for me. And what you're going to really do is you're going to take the portion of the helix, the data set from the helix that is in that vicinity, and you're going to use that data to reconstruct that slice. I can specify how thick I want that slice to be. Basically what I'm specifying there is how much of the helix of data do I want you to utilize to reconstruct that, right? If, the, if I say the slice is five millimeters in thick, well I may have the, the ribbon of the helix that actually wraps around that five millimeters a couple of times and I'll use all that data to make this reconstruction. Um, and then I can specify how far apart I want these slices to be. So if you ask your tech to give you five by fives, right, that means you want five millimeters thick and you want them spaced five millimeters apart. And that means there'll be no gap between them, right? Or you can ask them to give you three by threes, three millimeters thick, three millimeters apart. There'll be no gap between them. Occasionally we do some imaging where we ask for gaps, like maybe in a high resolution chest CT, right, we're going to get fairly thin slices, but we're, we're going to get them one centimeter apart, right, or something. But more and more in today's age, we don't use gap a, a whole lot. As a matter of fact, a more common thing to do is to have a little bit of overlap between these. So I may ask the tech to give me three by twos, give me three millimeter thick slices two millimeters apart to give me a little bit of overlap. Because it turns out if I want to do multi-planar reformatting, those images will actually look better if I've got a little bit of overlap between the two. So when we ask for a slice thickness for different applications, we, we usually ask for different things. If I need some high resolution imaging, like chest, right? I'm looking at the lung parenchyma here. I'm going to ask for fairly thin slices. And of course, I'm going to use a reconstruction filter that's better suited to that. It gives, preserves high resolution for me. That filter that's used in filtered back projection, can, I can use one that gives me a little bit higher resolution, or I can use one that gives me a little bit lower resolution. The trade-off is the higher resolution has, is a little noisier. The lower resolution one has less noise associated with it. So for this chest task where I want to look at the lung parenchyma, I really like to use right, at those nice thin slices. And when I also often have the tech send us a maybe three millimeter thick uh, slice for, to look to evaluate soft tissues, reconstructed with a slightly different uh, kernel and also windowed slightly different as well. And we'll talk about those. I just show these because I want to remind you, right, if we want to do some multiplanar reformatting, right, or some volume rendering, I really need thin slices to start with. And you want to remember to, if you're going to go to make some of these, then you need to ask for those. If you have the tech reconstruct five millimeter slices and then the raw data gets thrown out, you can't make these images look like this after that fact, right? So here's a nice coronal, coronal multiplanary format. It's just taking a, the axial 2D data set that was reconstructed in nice thin slices and reformatting it, right? It, it, there's no new filtered back projection that's gone. It's just taking that volume of data and cutting through it a different way and displaying it. What do we call this image? This is a maximum intensity projection image. It's a, uh, the slab looks fairly thick, a fairly thick slab MIP where the maximum value is done here. What is this one? This is a MINIP, right, the minimum intensity uh, proje projection here where the lowest valued pixel uh, gets displayed for this one. And this is a volume rendered image, and uh, we'll look at some of those. These are some shaded surface representations that we can make where now you almost have to, your image is created such that there's an 
artificial light source that's being shined on the object. And, and not only do you say when you, the pixel goes through, your, your ray goes through and strikes an object of a certain density, that light now kind of reflects back at you, what would that image look like? It's an artificially created representation of that referred to as a, a shaded surface display. Here's a shaded surface display of a hip. And this is the same hip, this is the volume rendering. In the volume rendering, we actually let that uh, line kind of continue to extend through like it would on an x-ray, and we ask each pixel along the path to contribute to the intensity that we show in the image. So notice on the volume rendering, you can see this screw that's buried beneath the bone surface, while on the shaded surface, where all we actually see is the surface of objects, we don't recognize, we don't see that that screw is there. In CT, we almost always reconstruct on a 512 by 512 pixel matrix, right? MR uses usually kind of 256 by 256 up to 512 by 12, but frankly, that's, that's quite variable in MR. We can, we can vary it quite a bit. Remember our chest x-rays, right? 2,500 by 2,000 or so. So we have nowhere near the resolution of a chest x-ray. Um, CT, the pixels are three times larger than they are there. But in CT, our field of view, our reconstructed field of view determines our in-plane resolution. And I think I tried to show this. So, so here's an axial reconstruction of a wrist in a patient who is able to put their wrist out straight forward along the z-axis of the scanner. So we brought down the field of view right to about 10 centimeters, and so if we want to calculate what the resolution is per pixel, well, we take the 512, and we take the 10 centimeters, sorry, and divide by the 512 pixel, and we get about 0.2 millimeters per pixel, okay? And I want you to see, understand how important this is, right? Pretty good quality image of that wrist there. By the way, reconstructed with a high resolution filter or kernel for bone and displayed with bone window settings that we'll look at in a second. <clears throat> Here's a patient who couldn't extend their arm out because they're in a splint. And so they had their arm not along the z-axis, but almost perpendicular to the z-axis, okay? And so notice now the tech, when they reconstructed, their reconstruction field of view is much larger. And it's more kind of in that sagittal plane rather than in that axial plane. So they then had to go ahead and create me some axial reformats that I'll show you in a second. But here we've got 25 centimeters, so now we take that 25 divided by 512, and our pixel, our resolution is half a millimeter per, per pixel, right? Two and a half times worse than in that other view. And if I display these images, you can see that. Now, they're, they're, they're windowed slightly differently. They're both kind of a bone windowing, but this one's got a slightly different bone window on it. Notice that these axial images had to be reformatted from that data set that was acquired kind of sagittally. And now I'm gonna blow this up so that this wrist is about this same size. Because remember, these pixels were much smaller than, than that. So, so there they are. Does everyone see how much better our resolution is by getting good positioning on the CT scanner and then reducing our reconstructed field of view to the size of the object that we wanted to see. I want you to understand that concept and how that works. And we'll utilize that sometimes, right? Sometimes when you'll see a pulmonary nodule and you're not sure if it's calcified or not, ask your tech to go back and get you reconstruct that area in a smaller field of view. And sometimes it'll help you identify some uh, uh, pixels, some calcium within that, that'll allow you to definitively call a nodule um, benign. We talked a little bit about beam quality, right, the quality of our x-ray beam. Um, that was really kind of the average energy, and we said that usually falls in kind of the one-third to one-half range of the maximum energy. And I want to emphasize one point we talked about, right? If you increase MA, or if you increase MAS, right, you increase the number of x-rays produced. You increase the quantity of the x-ray beam, you have no effect on the quality of the x-ray beam. If you increase KV, you increase both the quality and the quantity of the x-ray beam because you increase the number of x-rays that are produced. The higher the KV, the more efficient the production of x-rays. Remembering our equation, right? KV 
times the z of the material, for us that's almost always gonna be tungsten, times 10 to the minus six gives you a rough approximation of your efficiency for x-ray production. So as kV goes up, you're gonna make more x-rays of every energy, okay? Filtration, we've talked about over and over again, right? Increases uh, beam quality, but it decreases its quantity. It decreases the number of x-rays at all energies. So what happens as we adjust tube current? So here I've got a water phantom, right? A water phantom. And um, in the morning when the tech does quality control on your CT scanner, they put a water equivalent or a water phantom out there and they, they do an image of it. And does anyone know when they draw that ROI in there, where does that mean value of Hounsfield units have to lie as part of that quality control check? Does anyone know? Kind of plus or minus seven Hounsfield units, right? It should be zero. Water should be zero, but plus or minus seven or so. Well, if you drive the MA way down, notice KV stays the same at uh, 120, they're driving the MA way down. Here we're at 10 MA or so. Notice how much noisier that image gets. You can see that the mean Hounsfield units are still in that close to zero range, but the standard deviation is getting much higher. So changing the tube current has a substantial impact on the noise that we have in the image, and of course has an impact on the dose to the patient, right? The dose to the patient here is much higher than it is here. Here's tube voltage, and I'm, I'm not sure how, how well the, all of this projects. So here we've gone from 80 kV here to 100 kV to 120 kV to 140. Those are usually the four settings that you're allowed on most modern CT scanners. Here's the image noise level, okay? And everything is re relative, to, they're using for some of these numbers, the percentages relative to 120. So notice going to 140 results in a 17% decrease in noise. That's because you produce more x-rays when you increase that kV, right? And at 100, the noise is 42% higher than at 120. At 80, it's 74% higher than at 120. And of course, the CT dose index, something we're gonna talk about a little bit, which is a measure of the dose to the patient. Of course, as we go from 120 to 140, notice how significantly it increases. It increases almost 50%, right? Drops 40% and going from 120 down to 100, drops 48% uh, going down to, 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 to 80 right there. And I wanna say one thing though, right? These are all obtained with a, a constant tube current of around 200 MA, okay, around 200 MA. Remember, most of our modern CT scanners will adjust the MA to try and keep a, a, a certain level of noise in the image. In other words, you specify an MA effective that you would like for that particular scan. These are done just varying KV, leaving everything else constant. All right. So I want to mention a little bit about pitch. The word pitch has changed over time, and thus if you read books or read the literature, sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. And that has to do with when we first introduced uh, helical scanning, there was only a single row of detectors. And so pitch had to do with how wide that single row of detectors were compared to how far the uh, table of the CT scanner traveled during a single rotation. When we went to multi-row detector CT scanners, there now became two ways to define pitch. You could define it in terms of the width of a single row of your detector, or you could define it in terms of the overall width of all the rows combined. And that's when you're reading, sometimes it's a little confusing as to which one of those terminologies they may be using. So hopefully that's helped clarify um, that sometimes they're the term is used differently and you can just keep an eye out for that as you're reading a, reading a source. So slicer detector pitch, which is really applicable to those older days, right? We look at the distance that we end up traveling, right? And, and we divide that distance uh, by the width of a single slice on the, the scanner. And so long as the, the distance that we travel um, isn't greater than, uh, the, the, we don't travel more than twice the distance of the width of the slice, uh, then we can make a, a high quality reconstruction. When we talk about beam pitch, or frankly in modern literature, which is what is just called pitch now, 
we're really talking about the entire width of all of the detector rows together. So we take that distance traveled in one rotation and we divide by the width of all of those detectors. And again, if we don't travel more than twice that width, we can get a high quality reconstruction. If we travel more than twice W in ro one rotation, in other words, if pitch is greater than two, then our quality of our reconstruction is gonna suffer, okay? So the word pitch, uh, I think I've beaten like a dead horse. I'm just gonna say the concept that you need to know is simple. If in one rotation, the table travels more than twice the width of the detectors, then our image quality is gonna suffer. So we wanna make sure that pitch stays less than two. Lower pitch is slower, so if you notice studies where we like need to get through the entire chest in a, very quickly, we, we get that pitch up close to two, right, because that'll allow us to move things very quickly. The downside is that the higher pitch goes, you do lose a little bit of your resolution in the z-axis direction, right? The, the faster the thing is moving, it makes sense that your resolution isn't going to be quite as good in that direction. Um, <clears throat> if the pitch is less than one, it implies oversampling. So now our, our ribbon of our helix, they actually overlap each other a little bit. And so that results in increased radiation dose to the patient. We typically don't have pitch than less than one. Uh, and uh, there are sometimes times when it's helpful to have pitch slightly less than one, maybe 0.8 or so. so. And we can reconstruct any infinite number of images provided that helical raw data set is present. You can tell me a particular slice at which you want to reconstruct something in the patient, and we could ask the tech to reconstruct it right at that spot. So our acquired slice thickness, though, can't be any narrower than the width of the detector. Right? That, that should make sense. Even if we were operating in sequence mode, where we rotated 360 degrees around the patient without moving the table, right? the, the slice that I sampled is the width of the detector. I, it makes no sense to try and reconstruct slices that are thinner than that. There is a temptation in this day and age because we've got these multi-row detector scanners with 0.6 millimeter detectors to just acquire everything with the thinnest possible slices. But, but realize, right, if you want really thin slices with high image quality, that requires higher dose. And so really think about what is necessary for the particular CT application you're doing don't acquire slices at 0.6 millimeters if they're of no clinical use to you. You're just really insisting on a certain higher level of dose to the patient. Okay? Here are some images. <clears throat> Notice we're, we're going here from thinner slices to thicker, and the changes are subtle. Does everyone see some of the partial volume effect that's occurring where structures in and out of the plane are now being um, uh, incorporated into what we see in this pericardial fat. Does everyone see that here? Much sharper here on this thinner slice. As we get thicker, we get more of that volume averaging. Notice if you look in the fat, the speckling in the fat and uh, some of the areas here, notice how much that gets reduced here because of the noise, right? If we use thicker slices, we're using data from more x-ray acquisitions to make the reconstructed image, and our noise is determined by the number of x-rays that we actually have used for the data set. We, I've already mentioned that MPR is that 2D technique, right? And if we want to make those, like these coronal multiplanar reformats, I really need to have data that was acquired nice and thin. See all this stair-step artifact on these right here. I mentioned the fact that if you do a little overlap, you can actually make for more artifact. And I'm trying to remember exactly how these were done. I think these were in the order of two, three millimeters. These were done like threes every two. These are threes done every three. And does everyone see you still have a little bit of the stair step, but if you provide a little overlap, even with the same slice thickness, it gives a nice smoothing to the data set there. We, I have already mentioned the acquired slice thickness. You know, here's some of these modern scanners with up to 320 rows of detectors, each measuring kind of six millimeters uh, in thickness or so, um, that really allows us to acquire a huge amount of data very quickly. 
I want to talk a little bit about linear attenuation and how we express it in CT, right? We express it kind of as a, a derived measure, a Hounsfield unit that we all come, become familiar with. Um, recall that the intensity of that X-ray beam decreases exponentially as it passes through matter. Uh, that linear attenuation coefficient mu has units one over length. And it really depends on the atomic number, right, the, the Z, if you will, of the material, as well as its physical density. Um, that Hounsfield unit, Godfrey Hounsfield described, it's really a normalized unit of linear attenuation. So we take the linear attenuation of the material that we're interested in, we subtract off the linear attenuation of water, divide by the linear attenuation of, wa of water, and multiply by 1,000. So if the material is water, water minus water is zero, so the Hounsfield units of water should be zero. And then at the very bottom of the scale, if this measure were, if we were in a vacuum, the attenuation of a vacuum is zero. So then we just get a minus one for this quantity. So Hounsfield units of air or a vacuum should be minus a thousand. Notice there's no upper limit to this, but unfortunately, because we only encode Hounsfield units on the CT scanner in 12 bits of information, this number can't go over about 3,072, if I did my ma math right. You can turn on a feature called extended CT scale on some CT scanners that allows that to go a little bit higher. Okay? So when we're looking at an image, the pixel values are converted from true linear attenuation numbers to Hounsfield unit numbers. And we can control our window settings to bring out uh, different parts of the image for, for viewing. But in general, a wide width is used for inherent contrasted tissues, right? So when it's a high contrast task, we use a fairly wide width. So looking at the lung parenchyma, where we're looking for soft tissue nodules in the background of aerated lung is a really inherently high contrast task. I'm a bone and joint radiologist. I always use a fairly wide window when I'm looking at the osseous structures because looking for fractures, subtle fractures, is a high contrast task. When you're looking at the brain parenchyma and you want to separate gray matter from white matter, that's a very low contrast task. We need a narrower width to our window for that. Um, when we go to look at the liver and we're looking for subtle lesions, that's another low contrast task. Uh, we always want to put the center of our window on the tissue of interest. So when we want to be in the brain looking at soft tissue, we want our center around 40 Hounsfield units, 35 Hounsfield units or so, where the tissue of interest has its average value. Sometimes if we're looking between a pair of tissues, we may put that between them, like PE in the lung, right? Contrast in the lumen versus thrombin and thrombus in the lumen. We'll put our center right between those two, right between 70, 50 to 70 Hounsfield units for thrombus and the 300 Hounsfield units that the contrast opacified blood in the pulmonary arteries will usually have. So you usually find your center will fall in the 150, 175 range or so. And you know, if we've got our window uh, center uh, at 30 and a width of 40, then that means we're gonna split that 200 below 30 and 200 above. So any pixel whose Hounsfield units is less than minus 170 is gonna be completely black on the image and any pixel whose Hounsfield units is above 230 is going to be the brightest white on the image, and we won't be able to discern anything that's 500 Hounsfield units from anything that's 1,000. And, and you guys are, are familiar with that notion uh, for that win windowing. Um, you know, here's just an example. I took this, the same image, the same image here, displayed with a bunch of different window settings. So kind of our normal soft tissue window settings here, more of a bone window, and I think you guys can see that we've got a fairly similar center in these three windows, but our window width is decreasing. So notice here you can see the fat nicely. Now most of the fat is completely black, and now notice even the, the um, more dense structures. This is almost very close to just being kind of purely kind of black and white, and it won't surprise you what those window values, center values are there. 
we talked a little bit about spatial resolution and how we can use these line pair phantoms, right? How, how close can the lines get together before you can distinguish them? And we use line pair phantoms in CT as well. I just wanted to remind all of you that um, in CT, resolution, it turns out, drops as you get away from, further away from the center of rotation. So we always make radial line pairs because it's fairest to compare things an equidistance from the center of rotation here. And notice that as the line pairs get closer and closer together, it is hard to distinguish them as actually being separate entities. Of course, this isn't dependent just upon the properties of the CT scanner. It's also dependent upon the properties of the reconstruction algorithm that we use in CT. And you, you guys are familiar with that spatial resolution notation, that MTF curve we talked about doing. In CT, right, focal spot is an important component, the size of our detectors, the number of projections that we took, of course the reconstructed slice thickness, uh, and then also remember that filter that we used to do that. And here's an example of that. Here's a very subtle spinous process fracture we see on the high resolution bone kernel reconstruction here. Side by side, I'm going to show that bone kernel reconstruction with a lower resolution, better noise property, soft tissue kernel reconstruction, and that fracture is so subtle on that one that I, I don't know that you e even would find it there. Again, notice the more speckling appearance here, the little bit higher noise, the trade-off for that resolution. Um, of course, the pixel size and the display field of view. Once we've acquired our data, depending upon how big we make our matrix and what size field of view we apply that to determine. So here's a 50 centimeter field of view. And notice you, can, you really can't make out these line pairs anymore, bringing that all the way down to a 25 centimeter field of view. And now you can see them very nicely. And again, I think most of you can see that the trade-off here is the data is set as a little bit noisier here on that 25 centimeter field of view. We've, we've talked there a little bit about the in-plane resolution, right? The matrix size really determines the resolution in the plane of reconstruction. Remember that as our pitch increases, we're getting a little bit more of that blurring, if, if you will. You know, that's, that's blurring due to motion. The patient is moving while we're scanning, and the more they're moving, uh, the more blurring we get in that Z direction. So going from uh, an object which maybe had a very striking rectangular profile to it, at a pitch of one, that would get broadened out a little bit, and at a pitch of two, that would get broadened out a bit more. And these things are most noticeable, like at, at ribs, where structures are crossing through obliquely the reconstructed plane. You can see a little bit of the blurring there. When we talk about patient motion, it also has quite a bit of an effect on, on resolution. So, you know, sometimes if we, if we uh, can get the patient to hold their breath or make sure that they hold still, it certainly benefits us in terms of our spatial resolution. CT has very good contrast resolution, right? We can see those renal stones that may be barely perceptible to sometimes not perceptible at all on their conventional uh, plane film imaging. We've, we've talked about the noise properties uh, already, but I just wanted to show the phantom that has these different size and different contrast little spheres within it. Again, showing the important interplay between spatial resolution, contrast resolution, and noise in determining how conspicuous a lesion is. And of course, noise can be changed by increasing, by keeping the slice thickness the same and bumping up the MAS, but also you can increase your slice thickness and get less noise. So now the MAS is the same. These are just thinner and thinner slices and you see how much noisier you get. Now, this works well in parts of the body that are relatively uniform, but if things are varying a lot, across a short distance in the z-axis, the trade-off here is you get a lot of partial volume effects as you increase the slice thickness. So, so the image isn't as noisy, but you introduce more par partial volume. And I've, I've already shown this uh, multiple times. Again, 512 by 512 matrix, um, now showing a 50 centimeters field of view. In other words, 
it, the reconstruction on this is actually four times as big with a big black border around it, but I've just blown it up to be the same size as this one. Again, showing the better resolution properties, you can really start to make out some of these really small, uh, lower contrast structures, but the trade-off is, is a bit more noise there. Here is that same phantom just showing the application of a different reconstruction filter. And this was done on a Siemens scanner, so it's using the Siemens notation for the filters, the B20 being their smoothing filter, B40 kind of in the middle, the B60, their sharp, that would be used for, say, lung or for bone. Um, in GE, G actually has names for these where they kind of refer more to the body part rather than using these numbers. Here's some iterative techniques. Um, you notice in the iterative techniques, this is uh, adaptive statistical iterative reconstruction, one of the vendor's names for their iterative technique. And, and you can see that the noise property, the speckling of the noise that we see in filtered back projection really uh, changes as we go through this adaptive, uh, this iterative technique. And some people, when this was first introduced, I, I mentioned to you yesterday how some people were, really didn't like the look of digital MAMO when it was first introduced because they were so used to reading screen film. And the same thing here, you'll hear people who've read CT for many years talk about this almost has a, almost kind of a plasticky look to them, they'll say. And it's just really a different property of the noise texture, I think, that you have to get used to. We certainly see a lot of artifacts, and one of, one of my pet peeves as a guy who likes a little bit of medical imaging, a little bit of medical imaging artifacts, is I, I hear every artifact in an image called beam hardening. And I, I just want to say a little bit about what beam hardening really is and kind of what it isn't, so maybe we can be a little bit more judicious in identifying that. Um, you know, beam hardening, we talked about the fact that the further through some material the x-ray beam goes, the higher its mean energy goes the number of x-rays decreases, right? The, the, the quantity of the x-ray beam goes down, but its quality goes up. And so that means the next thickness of that same exact type of tissue is more easily penetrated by that x-ray beam uh, uh, that's remaining there. And so with Here's what you get. You get this kind of appearance. So a cylinder of uniform thickness of water would look less dense in the middle. And you can think about why that's the case, right? The x-ray that's coming in this direction, the x-rays that are coming in this direction, the lower energy ones of them get peeled off. So over time as it comes through, you actually end up with more x-rays at this end than you would have expected if you had a monochromatic x-ray beam of the average energy of the beam you started out with. So, so it says, well, somehow the middle of that thing must be a little bit less attenuating than I think it is because filtered back projection is the purely mathematical reconstruction that doesn't take into account the polychromatic nature of the X-ray beam. So there's some correction for that. You know, these artifacts that we see near the posterior fossa, they, they have to do with some of the scatter that occurs. Occasionally, we get some, what are truly some um, uh, beam hardening effects in those range, but, but a lot of times where these dense areas are, we get some streak artifact. Sometimes, especially around arthroplasties, frankly, we just get photon starvation, where no x-rays make it through that structure. So it's not beam hardening, it's just complete lack of any x-ray information making it through. And another artifact, other mentioned it when he talked about MR, it happens in CT as well. Around these sharp edges, that filtered back projection reconstruction method has inherent to it some of the properties of the Fourier transform, where we're using kind of wave-like constructs to, to do some reconstruction. And we get that same Gibbs phenomenon, that same ringing kind of artifact, uh, streaking artifact at the sharp corners of objects. Of course, there aren't too many of these sharp corners in the human anatomy, but there are times when we see them, again, around arthroplasties and, and certain osseous structures in the body. And we can't leave out those motion artifacts, right? Motion creates a tremendous amount of artifact in our images. As a matter of fact, there, uh, the other thing I always mention is, you know, make sure you can keep the patient as still as you can and make sure you get the patient 
positioned the best way that you can for the study. I showed you that wrist CT with the wrist completely out front along the scanner versus angled uh, and, and how much difference that made in the quality of the images. What's the difference between these two images here? Really the difference is the patient's arms are by their sides, right? And when you're looking at the axial images, especially if your text reconstructed axial field of view doesn't show that the arms are there in the way, you only appreciate this as kind of a lot of streak artifact in your axial image. It's, sometimes it's a little easier to see when you look at the coronal reformat, what's going on there. And there are some artifacts related to a scanner. You know, the, when you look at a, a, a water phantom or a very uniform area in the body, so sometimes you'll see this, if the patient's bladder is distended with fluid, with urine, with water, it should really look very homogeneous. And you will see these subtle ring artifacts. And that's due to not quite perfect calibration of the CT scanner. Each of the detectors have slightly different sensitivity, and that needs to be corrected for uh, in terms of that. If you have one of your detector elements go bad, that can appear either as a, a bright spot or a dark spot within the image. And in our old sequence mode, where we just did a circle, right, the tube rotated one time around the patient, then the table shifted forward a little bit, and then we did that again, it made a, a complete circle. And the diameter of the circle had to do with how far that bad detector was from the mid aspect of the detector row. But now in helical scanning, what you'll notice is that that thing will come in and out of plane as it spirals through your images. Um, because remember that we may be using data from multiple different rows of detectors to reconstruct that single slice that you're looking at. So you won't necessarily see a complete 360 degree circle in a single image from that. Make sense? We've already talked about some of the reconstruction artifacts, how if you don't make your slices thin enough, perhaps give them a little bit of overlap, you get this bad stair step um, reconstruction artifact. So just to go through some of those. I want to talk some about CT dose. And we just finished talking a little bit about how we measure dose, but there's some things about that that are unique to CT. And so I'm going to um, go through a, a little bit of justification here. Um, there's some slides in your handout that are the slides that were in my previous talk. I'm probably going to skip through those to save us a little bit of time, right? So wh why all the talk? Well, there's so much uh, press and I think we've done a good job responding to that, but about you know, five, 10 years ago, I mean, it was just through the press how much uh, deleterious effects we were having from CT scanning. Um, so I wanna motivate us to kind of uh, talk about that. You know, you're gonna be considered the expert. When the patient comes and has a question about the dose of the scan and whether they should get it, someone's gonna call you and ask you to come talk, talk to them. Remember that CT is that largest contributor, uh, and there's many uh, factors that are in our control to help minimize that. And certainly, I always emphasize that patient. Look, we, we really designed this protocol to keep that dose as low as we can uh, reasonably achieve and still get good diagnostic quality images. And you know, for most, I mean, if, if someone in the tells you, I'm concerned this patient has appendicitis, right, the, the, ri the benefits of scanning far outweigh the risks in the, that situation. Okay. So discussion with patients, maybe education of some of your non-radiologic uh, colleagues in terms of looking at new equipment, and maybe you're, set, you know, you're the one who's tasked with designing new protocols. There are all sorts of uh, uh, situations in which you really are going to have to know some of this information. I love this article, although it's getting a bit uh, dated now, it's back in 2005, and um, you know, medical x-rays added to the government's carcinogen list. Okay, well, well we knew medical x-rays were potential, we knew x-rays and gamma rays were potential car carcinogens way before 2005, so uh, just, um, you know, fi finally catching up in ter terms of doing that. The bigger question is, how big a risk do they pose at diagnostic levels? Um, and, and that we still don't have a great um, answer to. Um, I think this just emphasizes the point that we talked about, whether you, whether you like it or not, people are going to view you as the expert, um, and by virtue of your training in physics, are going to be the gatekeepers in regard to that technology. So, 
there was a, a little research study that was done, and they asked people this question, okay, and they, who'd they ask it to? They asked it to patients in the ED, they asked it to ED physicians, and they asked it to radiologists, okay? So for an average CT, right, CT of the abdomen, where does the radiation dose fall compared to a two-view chest X-ray? Is it less than a chest X-ray, or is it greater than 500 chest X-rays with various selections in between? So here we are, here are patients, right? There were 19 of the 67 patients who thought CT was less, right? There were 43 who thought it was in the range of uh, one to, to 10 two-view chest X-ray studies, right? And, and very few, zero, right? Very few thought it was the actual number or the number that was a bit too high. ED physicians, maybe a little bit better, right? 22%, 10 of the ED physicians were in the right range and three of them thought it was less than a chest X-ray. The scary part is that there were a couple of radiologists who fell in that group as well and I, I hope nobody in this room is, is in that situation, right? Um, and then I thought these other things were, were important as well, right? They asked the patients, they asked the ED physician and they ask the radiologist, you know, wh which ones of um, the risks and benefits outlined to the pa patient before the CT. And five of the 76 patients said that was done. Uh, the ED physician, 10 out of the 45, said that was some something that was done, and, and six out of the 45 radiologists. And how, how many of the patients actually mentioned the dose, you know, to, and the notice the dose was mentioned much less frequently as one of the, one of the risks of doing that. Um, and then here's the one, what's the, what's the, what do you think the lifetime risk of cancer? Do you think that that's increased by having a CT scan? And only two of the 76 patients, 3% of them did. Four of the 45 uh, AD physicians and 47%, 18 of the 38 radiologists. So that, that's, that's better, better there. And, and, and the truth is, you know, we, we think there is a very small risk, but we don't have a great uh, idea of, of what that risk is, is probably the current um, best that we can say about that. Unfortunately, impactscan.org, which gave great information in terms of CT scanners and dose and some of the different proper properties, this was a, an organization funded by the UK government. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, organization doesn't exist anymore, but I think the website is still up and it's a great source for some educational information. But so how about when you're the expert in terms of protocol design and selection? There are some other sources other than that website, and I'll just remind you of a couple of them. Remember, we're gonna look at specific adult versus pediatric studies, um, and we've talked about the fact that how small patients receive a much higher dose uh, of radiation and, and really how important that is in CT and why that is the case in CT. We're gonna certainly minimize num number of phases, region of covery, perhaps select other modalities, um, MR or ultrasound uh, rather than CT. See, there, there are a number of websites out there where people try to keep lists of kind of up-to-date protocols with current scan technology. This is one of them. Um, Elliot Fishman does not pay me to, to, to bring this one up. Like I said, there are a number of them out there, but if you're ever at a place and you, you've got a new scanner and you, or you've got a new um, vendor for a scanner and you want a good starting part, point, this is a, certainly a, a nice source for doing that. Um, why perform CT when MR is safer and perhaps better? This is uh, Rich Samelka, who was at the who was at the University of North Carolina, and I would say, you know, why? Well, because I think sometimes CT is the best best study. It's not always, but sometimes CT is the best study to answer the clinical question. We mentioned uh, the fact that how big a contributor CT is to total uh, radiation dose in the country, so I don't think I need to go over that again. We've talked about, I showed this before, and I just wanted to say, right, if you look at CT numbers, look at that abdomen pelvis CT in the order of um, 10 millisieverts or so, notice how much higher that is really than uh, one chest x-ray, right? that hundreds of times higher there. And by the way, we've done a good job, notice these are the numbers from back in 2001. We've done a good job bringing some of these numbers down uh, in the chest, uh, abdomen, and pelvis, getting, getting them more in line with almost close to half the values that they were back at that time. 
So what about these deleterious effects, right? Remember I told you if you assume that linear no threshold model and you assume that that's right, and remember we're assuming it because we want to be overly conservative, not because we actually believe it's the most accurate description. The truth is we don't know what the most accurate description is, so let's be overly conservative. Well, but if you take that overly conservative estimate and you multiply it by the total number of people getting scans, you now start to generate these alarming numbers, like 1,500 children are going to die in the future because of these CT scans that are, are going on. And that's, it's really un, un, unfortunate uh, that, that that occurs. But, but it certainly is true that the deleterious effects of radiation are greater the younger an individual is, right? They're, they're more radiation sensitive and also they have uh, a greater time to live post that radiation exposure. So, so the risk per unit dose tends to be higher in those age groups. And there are some slight differences in, in men and women and most of them really have to do with breast sensitivity, tissue sensitivity between those, those two groups. Um, here's one on uh, dental x-rays, uh, just a grid showing how much we love to scan in the U.S., right, how much of our attributable risk uh, is due to annual, how much we love to image things, um, and we're not the, the worst in the world, right, uh, Japan pro it seems to like imaging even more than we, we do. The other thing I want to mention before I finish up is, you know, I don't want to suggest that the only deleterious effect that, uh, that may occur is the induction of cancer. There's some evidence out, you know, that radiation to the developing brain in kids potentially has some deleterious effect as well. And we want to keep those kind of things in mind as we, as we scan. That's really hard to quantify. I mean, if you think about the studies you would need to do, right? I mean, you really want to control for kids who are having a CT scan with similar kids. So, so you know, if you look at people who didn't have a head CT, what would their, what's the appropriate matched person to someone who was getting a head CT to look at differences in um, uh, cognitive development over time? But there are some studies that show that there is some effect. And if people go to the FDA webpage, the FDA is going to say a CT examination with an effective dose of 10 millisieverts may be associated with an increase in the possibility of fatal cancer of approximately one chance in 2000. Now, I, I don't have a huge issue with that statement, but let me emphasize a few words, right, as I say it. May be associated with, right, in approximately one chance in 2000. And yet when your patient reads that sentence, that's not what they read, right? They read, a CT scan has a one in 2,000 risk of giving me a cancer, right? That's how they read it, and um, so that, that puts us where we are. Well, I hope just going through some of those things provided a little bit of motivation for talking about uh, dose. You know, there's ongoing controversy regarding the magnitude of risk pre uh, presented by diagnostic dose of radiation. You know, there's almost no controversy regarding the notion that the risk of diagnostic uh, doses of radiation is real and inversely related to age. It, it may be exceedingly small, but, but most people feel that's true. There's not a whole lot of people out there arguing for a uh, hormesis, right, to say that the, the lower doses of radiation are actually beneficial, although you, you can find a few. So in general, right, we're just going to try to keep our doses as low as reasonably achievable to get us the quality study that we need. Well, here's where I'm going to skip a few slides rather than go through some of that dose stuff again. Remember, we talked a little bit about exposure and air kerma of what that was and absorbed dose. Remember, that was going to be the thing we're really going to use to look at deterministic effects of our radiation exposure. And then effective dose, that was going to be the thing to look at the population risk uh, for stochastic uh, uh, processes. But when you look at the CT scanner, you see something looks like this. And this is from a routine head CT. This is a routine head CT done in sequence mode, not spiral mode. So this has a CTDIW, not a CTDI volume associated with it. And I'm going to describe for you what the difference between those are. And we've got the DLP, the dose length product here, which is just this quantity multiplied by the length of the scan, okay? But let's talk about how we get this 
quantity, this CT dose index weighted, which is going to be kind of our CT equivalent of that absorbed dose number that we were looking at. Well, the first thing I want you to realize is that the dose gradient in CT is very different than it is in plain film imaging, right? When we take an X-ray of someone, we've talked about the fact that the majority of the dose is deposited at the skin surface or just below the level of the skin surface. And the dose that gets deposited in the tissues decreases as you go deeper and deeper. The problem in CT is you rotate the tube completely around the patient. So, you know, this dose that was deposited superficially here also gets deposited here when the tube is in this position. And it adds to the dose that had, to this small amount of dose that was there. So you get this dose profile that's like concentric rings, if you will, of dose, where the highest dose is at the periphery of the object and the decreasing dose gets down towards the center. Now I want you to think about in your mind, what if this, we use the same exact settings on the x-ray tube, the same KV, the same MA, but this object were now smaller. Well, let's just think about the x-ray tube in one position, right? We get that same entrance skin dose here, but since the object isn't as thick, at the deep end of the surface, let's say the object ends here, we ha now have that much dose being deposited at the deep end of the object, right? And now we rotate that tube around. Does everyone see that a smaller object ends up with much higher dose in CT if we keep the parameters the same, okay? Because of this uh, 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 phenomenon that we just talked about that you get this concentric ring deposition as we go through. So when we want to know how much dose is deposited in a single slice of a CT image, we really need to measure the dose at the periphery and the dose at the center, or we could if we wanted to even measure it somewhere in between. But that's what's done. We measure it at the periphery and we measure it at the center to get a rough idea of what the dose is for that. So here's our patient. Here we're now, just assume we're in kind of that sequence mode where we're just gonna rotate 360 degrees while the table sits perfectly still. Well, remember the tube, ha the beam has a certain width to it, right, as it opens up. It's not a true pinpoint source there. And we're also gonna get a little bit of scatter. So if we wanna know how much dose the patient absorbed, we can't just look at this thing, single, tiny little thin slice there. Because, so we need to look over this slice profile where most of the dose is gonna be deposited centrally, but we're gonna get a little bit of dose deposited in the tissues away from the slice, a few centimeters above and below. And that's where this comes in. This is the CTDI 100. We actually add up the dose or take the integral five centimeters above and below. I actually would prefer they would write this as 50 millimeters above and below, and then you'd understand why this was a CTDI 100, right? We're gonna integrate 50 millimeters above and below uh, whatever the amount of the profile is in that single slice. So in a sense, we're integrating the area under that dose curve. Well, remember, for any given slice, the dose is gonna be higher at the periphery than it is at the center. So how do, how do we go about doing this? Well, we actually, there are actually phantoms. There are actually phantoms that you put pencil detectors in. You can stick one in the um, periphery and you stick one in the center. They're made out of a, a lucite type material that's sort of tissue equivalent. And you pop them in the scanner and you set a certain KV and an MA uh, and a pitch and you make the measurements of that, of that there. So that's how those get estimated. And that brings us to a good point, right? There's a body phantom that's 32 centimeters in diameter, and there's a head phantom that's 16 centimeters in diameter. And those, thing, those CTDI numbers are calculated using those two phantoms. So the first thing that we have to dispose ourselves of is the notion that the CTDI W, or the CTDI volume, has anything to do with the dose the patient is receiving. It's the dose that the phantom would be receiving if we had put those parameters on the x-ray tube, okay? And for the body studies, we use the 32 centimeter phantom, and for the head studies, we use the 16 centimeter phantom. So 
Those measurements have to do with output of the X-ray, I'm sorry, the CT scanner. They have nothing to do with the dose absorbed by the specific <laughs> patient who's in the scanner. As a matter of fact, when your tech puts in the KV, and they put in the MA, and they put in the pitch for the study, you can see the CTDI volume displayed on the screen. That ought to tell you it has nothing to do with the dose the patient's going to actually receive if you can see it before the scan even occurs, okay? All right, so we've talked a little bit about how that CTDI weighted is calculated, okay? And I'm gonna now talk a little bit about extending that notion to CTDI volume and then making the uh, DLP calculation. The CTDI volume is a, an extension of the CTDI weighted when we move to helical scanning because now the table is going to be moving. And remember, if the pitch is one, then that's very similar to, then the table movement is exactly the width of the detector, right? The width of the beam of the X-ray the beam, if you will. And so in that case, this pitch factor is one. We multiply the CTDI volume by one, I'm sorry, the CTDI weighted by one, and that gives us the CTDI volume. They're basically the same when pitch is one. If pitch is less than one, I'm sorry, multiply by, I meant to say divide by. If pitch is less than one, let's say 0.8, we now divide this number by 0.8 here, and so the CTDI volume is greater than the CTDI weighted. If the pitch is high, look up at two, now we're moving the patient through more rapidly and the dose that the patient receives per unit volume of tissue is less. Or more appropriately said, the dose that the 32 centimeter phantom receives is less. Now I've told you that these don't actually apply to the specific patient's dose that's on the scanner, but that doesn't mean they're not useful, right? Let's say someone's proposing two new protocols for us to use for a particular study. Certainly if we type the parameters in for both the protocols on the scanner and we see what the CTDI volume is for the two protocols and we then do some test scans with them and decide whether we feel like the image quality is the same. Let's say we feel like the image quality is about the same. Well, go with the one that has the lower CTDI volume, right? That has the lower dose study, and if you feel like all other things are equal, then certainly make your decision based upon that. So they are useful numbers for comparing studies to each other. They just don't tell us anything about the specific dose that the patient received. All right, so CTDI volume is the dose in that is a measure of the radiation output of the scanner, not the dose to the patients. Measured using that standard acrylic phantom, the CTDI volume for a smaller patient, right, will receive a higher dose than for a larger patient, right? So if I've got a smaller patient on the scanner, I'm looking at the CTDI volume number, I've got the same KV is 140, MAS is 250 uh, effective, and my pitch is two. And now I put a larger patient on the scanner, that larger patient is gonna see less dose than that smaller patient, right? For the reasons we just talk, talked about, all right. I talked about this cylinder and how those things get measured. These little pencil beams are how long? They're 100 millimeters long. That's what basically sums over that profile. 50 millimeters above and below the central slice that we're using to scan. So there's that CTDI volume measurement from a routine chest CT done in spiral mode instead of sequence mode. So when you image in sp uh, spiral or helical mode, you'll see a CTDI volume number. And now this DLP again is just that number multiplied by the length of the scan, the z-axis length of the scan. That CTDI volume is proportional to the absorbed dose of an average patient, if you will, or the phantom, right, and is independent of scan length. The DLP is proportional to scan length and tries to get us a little bit closer to the effective dose of an average patient. Um, it's not quite there yet because the, only, the one thing that's missing are the tissue weightings, right? I mean, if you're scanning radiosensitive tissues, that number should be different uh, for that. So it's not quite perfect in, in that regard. I think I've beaten this uh, 
point enough, so, so we'll move, move on there. So how do, how do we calculate? How do we get a good estimate of what some of the true effective doses are? Well, believe it or not, there's a, a lot of uh, different types of phantoms with, which have li little dosimeters built inside them in tissue, liver equivalent tissue in the liver location with a, a dosimeter in it to measure dose and in the breast tissue, if you will. And notice their pediatric size and, and other, other parts there. That can be really be used to set some parameters and try to get a better true estimate of what the organ doses are uh, for a CT scan. And if we know those organ doses, we then can then apply the appropriate weighting factors to calculate the effective dose. Another way to do that is there's some mathematical phantoms where you have kind of this, you know, lung tissue that's got a mathematical description to it and heart and uh, the GI tract and the gonads and everything. And, and it mathematically simulates what a scan would be like and what the doses would be there. And, and it'll give you some output like this that'll show you what the effective dose for a particular study would be. You know, there are a number of publications, and frankly, there are some apps out there that do this, that say, oh, well, if you know what the DLP is from your scanner, just apply this factor to it, multiply this factor times it, and that'll give you what the effective dose is. Okay. What did we say the DLP was? Did it have anything to do with the dose to the patient? No. So this would give you an accurate reflection of what the effective dose would be, if you will, to the phantom, okay? okay. So, so the problem with this is this young number might be useful on a population basis, right? Because on average, the phantom that we use, that 32 centimeter phantom, is supposed to represent an average patient, right? So if you looked at these numbers, this might give you some information that was useful for a population average, right? But does it give you decent information for that specific patient? And the answer is no. So therefore, I don't really advocate anyone doing this. I mean, it's, it's fine to do it, but I, I don't advocate anyone recording that piece of information. Let the DLP and let the um, CTDI vol exist in your report if you want that to exist. But don't, don't make matters worse by extending the notion of what this is applicable to and almost making the assertion that it's applicable to your individual patient when we know that that's not what it's meant for. Right, we've already talked about it's this derived measure that attempts to quantify the stochastic risk to a population and not to a particular individual. And there are many assumptions about how that's even calculated, and which makes it even more problematic to applying it to an individual. I mean, here's another one where you now take these K factors, depending on the body part of the CT, and you multiply it by the, um, the, the K factor times the DLP for the study based on the body region and the age. And you and I know that, you know, five-year-olds vary tremendously in terms of their size. So is this age even the appropriate way to go about this? So bringing up what I just talked about, one thing that does try to help correct that a little bit more is something called size-specific dose information, where we're now going to take that CTDI volume or the DLP, if you want, and we're going to correct for the true size of the patient. In essence, what is trying to say, you know, what would the dose have been if we'd been measured using a phantom that had the patient's dimensions instead of that standard 32 centimeter size. And so basically to get the size specific dose estimate, we take that CTDI volume and we multiply it by an appropriate correction factor. And you can look up these tables of correction factors. So th these are different depending on what pieces of information you have about the patient, uh, these d four different tables. I'm just going to turn your attention to table one here. Basically, if I know what the lateral dimension of the patient is, uh, left to right dimension, and their anteroposterior dimension, I can add those together in centimeters, and it'll give me a number that allows me to correct for that size of the patient. So here's my conversion factor to cor correct that, okay? So, so let's, let's apply this to an example. So here we have a pelvis CT. I'm an MSK guy, so this is a, a pelvis CT done on a young woman who was suspected of having femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. Here's our CTDI volume, 6.17. 
Here's the patient. Her AP dimension is 18.6 centimeters. We actually took the, I took the um, left to right dimension or the lateral dimension from the topogram, okay? Just a rough idea. What if people think and we're gonna end up in terms of her size specific dose estimate? Something higher than or something lower than the CTDI volume here? Yes? Higher or lower? How many people vote higher? Higher, right? I mean, look at this patient. She's quite thin, right? Compared to our 32 centimeter phantom, her dimensions are going to be smaller than that. And so we expect that she is going to see a higher dose. We, so we'd expect our correction factor to be greater than one. So her AP diameter, 18.6, I took off of that. I took her lateral diameter, left to right dimension, 37.4 centimeters from the AP topogram. You add those together, you get 56. You come down to 56 on that table, uh, 1A, and you get a correction factor of 1.35. Um, so we need to take her um, CTDI volume, multiply it by 1.35, and we get a correction to 8.13 milligrays there. Okay, so about 35% higher, right, than we would have anticipated by just reading the DLP off of the scanner. So that's one way to start to try to correct some of those numbers to better represent what's going on with the actual patient rather than what's going on with some generic phantom. CTDI uh, and it's all its volumes are, are uh, measures of absorbed dose specific to CT, right? The numbers on the scan patient information sheet are estimates of, not the true dose absorbed that the patient received there, right? The DLP is a limited attempt to measure something that's related to the effective dose. The true effective dose is extremely difficult to measure in all but the kind of simplest uh, examples. So let's go through some dose reduction strategies, right, for, for our techs. Try to remind your techs to limit the scanned area to the region of interest. If anything, I see techs try to, you know, you get a little creep where the region of interest, I tease them about sending me chabdomens, right, when I want an abdomen and pelvis and you just get a little more chest than you were looking for on those. Um, you know, KV, MA, collimation, those things are, should be set by the protocol. And so now sometimes right, we're setting an effective MAS. In other words, we're asking for a specific noise level in the image. And sometimes now we're even letting the scanner decide what's the most appropriate KV to paste, based on the topogram information. We're going to increase pitch if, if possible. Uh, we're going to shield superficial org organs, but in CT we tend not to want to shield things if they're outside of the direct area that's going to be scanned, right? Because remember, most of their dose is going to be from scattering the patient, and you're not going to affect that by putting a shield exterior to, to them. So we really want to be careful with shielding in CT. And we want to use individualized imaging protocols uh, when we're working with uh, children. And on that CT uh, is us, or if you go to some of the other sites that are out there, they will give you dedicated pediatric protocols for that purpose. I think we've already made this point, why it is that small patients, pediatric patients, receive much greater doses given a fixed set of parameters. And this is a nice ex phantom experiment that, that shows that. At a given KV, change the phantom, make the phantom diameter smaller, and you really see a marked increase in the dose received there. For us, you know, we really want to make sure that studies are justified, and we'll talk to the referring clinicians uh, if, we, if we don't feel that's the case, and try to be helpful in making them make a decision, a better alternative, those kind of things when that's the, the case. Um, you know, we'd really like for CTs uh, to be generated by qualified medical personnel. I mean, I know in, in some areas there are problems with uh, basically a triage person ordering studies, sometimes advanced imaging. Um, in certain states, there, there are actually laws that uh, say that, you know, it, advanced imaging studies like CT have to be ordered by, after a physician has seen the patient, but that's not uni universally true. Um, Ideally, we'd really like the physician to have evaluated them, weighed the benefit versus the risk beforehand. You try to educate your non-radiology physicians in, in terms of some of the guidelines for doing that. Uh, 
Of course, we've talked about are there some alternative studies out there that are equally suited to answering the question. Uh, we've talked about the importance of uh, selecting appropriate protocols, minimizing phases of contrast enhancement. I think we used to err on, you know, additional phases of contrast enhancement. We've really tried to narrow that down over the last few years to help bring that dose down. Um, and we don't want to repeat uh, studies without a clear clinical indication. I think something else we're reluctant to do is, you know, if, if the question is just to, to check an area, a, a, a focal area, do we really need to do an entire abdomen and pelvis all over again when we really are focusing on a particular area of pathology? And this just emphasizes the point of selecting that appropriate protocol, right? Here's a, a lung screening examination with a DLP of around uh, 93. Here's a routine chest CT, DLP around 251. And here's a PE protocol chest CT, the DLP is about twice that, not quite twice that, at about 419, right? So, you know, when that person says, well, um, yeah, I'm really not sure of, would you just do the PE protocol, you know, kind of thing, because you, you'll see the lung parenchyma there as well or whatever. You know, realize we really want to try and do a better job tailoring our protocols to the specific clinical question. Um, Certainly, we love to have some old studies, right? That always helps us in terms of, uh, um, I, I think I've mentioned this multiple times, be vigilant in regard to the justification of imaging studies, and especially in children, pregnant women, uh, chest CT studies in young women because of the increased sensitivity of the breast tissue. Um, be aware of the quality of studies you are reading. You know, take a look at those CTDI volume numbers and those DLP numbers and, and take a look at the quality of the imaging that you're getting. Can you afford to, to bump that down a little bit? If you went to 100 kV as a routine for uh, most of your studies, would that image quality still be sufficient for you? Um, be critical in terms of your protocols, I guess is what I'm saying and help provide feedback to your technologists as well. We actually, for MSK, we, we have the technologists, they've got a little sheet that's next to them that uses the ACR's uh, dose index registry and it lists for them the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile for dose on CT of different joints, uh, MSK body parts. And we ask the techs to call us if when they set up for a particular study, their CTDI falls outside of that range, either below because we're concerned we'll get a really noisy study or above because we're concerned do we really need to give that much dose to the patient for, for the study. Um, for, for the radiologist, you know, can we move to some more advanced concepts such as size specific dose estimation to help us tailor some of our protocols for particular patients? This is under future advances, and frankly, I should have moved it out to, to the general area, right? Ex automatic exposure control in CT is really an evolving process. Um, right now, the current is modulated. The voltage is, is not modulated necessarily during the scan, but I'm sure that's going to come uh, as well. So from the topogram, we know that the you know, lungs are less dense than when we get into the upper part of the abdomen, so we don't need to use as much of an MAS. When we're in the anteroposterior projection, we don't need to use as much MAS as when we're on the, the tubes on the lateral side of the patient, and so we can modulate that current as we're rotating across the patient. Now we can even do more sophisticated things. You know, there are scanners out there that'll decrease the x-ray tube output anteriorly when they're doing uh, chest imaging in a woman. So therefore, decreasing the radiation dose to the breast while th that's being done. So some really nice, sophisticated things in terms of doing that. You know, beautiful pictures come at the price of higher radiation dose. And so, you know, in CT and in, our, in, in computed, ra in, in digital radiography, there's no penalty for overexposing the patient. You know, in the old film days, if you overexposed the patient, the film wasn't readable anymore. So there was a penalty. You, you had to stay in the sweet spot there. And we've lost that. You know, what level of quality is really necessary for an accurate diagnosis? And this is, um, one of my former colleagues, Bruce Whiting, where he looked at CTs with kind of simulated levels of noise. So our, our current protocol at the time, 
uh, the image that would be created with a 50% dose reduction, 75, 87 and a half, 96%, 99. And you know, really, where do we need to be? Do we need to be operating at this level? Can we afford that dose reduction? And perhaps that's task dependent. You know, if you're looking for subtle, low contrast liver lesions, right, you really can't afford much in the background of noise. Your lesion conspicuity is going to decrease uh, in the setting of noise if the object you're looking for is small or if it's low contrast, right? If you're pushing the limits of your resolution or your, your contrast. So that may be um, uh, specific to a particular application, but I, I really think it's something we need to, to consider. As time goes on, we're going to get better detectors, right? We mentioned the fact that not all the radiation that makes it through the patient ends up stopped by the detector. So the better job the detector can do stopping the radiation, the less radiation dose we'll have to give the patient. Um, the iterative reconstruction methods actually handle noise a little bit better, so perhaps we can work with a little higher levels of noise if we're using iterative techniques. Um, Perhaps in the future we'll have some improved x-ray sources, although something like a monochromatic x-ray source is certainly a pipe dream. Um, and there's certainly some newer imaging technologies, you know, are always under development, and perhaps some of those won't use ionizing radiation and we'll be able to, to utilize them in the fast. So CT is that largest contributor to patient dose in diagnostic radiology. Um, radiologists increasingly need to inform the patients and their colleagues regarding the risk versus benefits. You should understand at least how that dose is measured and uh, be able to explain some of those things uh, to your colleagues. Um, and you should be able to employ some of the strategies we talked about to really uh, help keep that Alara concept um, uh, going. So what's your clinical question, right? Let's select our parameters for a basic protocol, make adjustments based on age, think about what our reconstruction technique's gonna be, iterative, um, we could always cancel a study, convert it to another modality, um, really restrict to a particular anatomic region, uh, decide what kind of anatomic level of detail is required. In other words, do we really need those really, really thin slices and do we really need that really low contrast, I mean uh, high contrast to be able to see the lesion that we're talking about. And then our number of phases we also talked about. Remember that dose is directly proportional to the MAS. Cutting the MAS in half cuts the dose in half. The price is that we'll get a 30% increase in the noise in our image. Current scanners modulate that tube current in real time. I've mentioned that to you as well. And so instead what we provide to them, rather than being the current, the MAS that's used throughout, we provide an MAS which basically is specifying a noise level that we would like to have in all of our images. So if it's imaging a portion of the body like the lung that stops less of the radiation, it can drop the MA down and still maintain that noise level. And if it's imaging a part, a thicker part of the body, if you will, or where there's more attenuating structures like the bones within the pelvis, it may have to bump that MA up to, to maintain that same level of noise. Basically, it, it does some of those things using the scout image to determine that dose. Um, you know, too low re results in some quantum model, and we'll see that sometimes using a reference AMS, especially on really large patients. And another time when you might see it is, realize that that change can't happen instantaneously. And so on some of the scanners, as you go from the bases of the lungs and start to get into the liver, you'll notice that the dose may not quite have bumped, the MA may not quite have bumped up yet on those first couple of slices, and those will be a little bit noisier than the liver as you go through the rest of it. Remember that in regard to KV, that dose is proportional to the KV to the nth power, where that power is somewhere in the two to three range. Some people say about 2.6 or so. So reducing KV by a third from 120 to 80 cuts the dose by more than one half. So that's a, a tremendous savings there. Um, the newest generation of scanners can select the tube voltage based on the topogram. This is a correction. In, in your thing, I said, can, can change it in real time. And, and some people misinterpret that as thinking that the voltage was changing while the scan was being done. And what I meant to imply by that was that the voltage can be changed um, at the time the scan is being done. In other words, based on the topogram kind of information. 
Remember that tissue contrast is improved at lower KV, but the price is some greater noise. And frankly, that's a little bit less of an issue to us in CT than it is in plain film imaging because we have so much better contrast resolution because of the to tomographic technique, right? We've gotten rid of the overlapping structures so we can see some of those things better anyway. Many centers are now using 30 uh, kV uh, routinely in pa patients who have body mass indexes low lower than 30. So it drops the dose by over 33%. Remember, we want to, especially if we've got CTA studies where there's contrast on board, we'd still like to keep the effective kV high enough that the uh, average KEV of our X-ray beam is above the K edge of iodine, right above 33 KEV. Pitch we've talked about, right? Pitch, the changes in pitch are changed dose proportionally. So if you, um, or in inversely, right? If we go from a pitch of one to a pitch of two, we're gonna cut the dose in half. If we go from a pitch of one down to a pitch of a half, half we're gonna double the dose. Uh, higher pitch can result in some unwanted artifacts, but so long as we keep that pitch lower than two, those really usually aren't very noticeable to us. We've talked about protocol adjustments over and over, um, adjustments based on size-specific dose estimation some people have suggested, certainly tables for uh, MAS or KV based on patient uh, body mass index uh, are another possibility. And we'll, and, I, like I said, continue to review and refine your protocols to really get your dose down. I mentioned iterative reconstruction. Some people have estimated that they may be able to uh, reduce dose 40% and have the same noise level in an iterative reconstructed image compared to the old filtered back projection. Um, Downsize, manufacturers still have a lot of different techniques which have some of their own artifacts associated with them and I think we're gonna have to wade through some of that um, as time goes on. And I think this is the last image in my talk here, um, so it's a, a nice example. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys can see the DLP here. What's the DLP number right here? 1,054, remember I showed you the numbers for a uh, screening chest CT, a routine chest CT, and the PE protocol chest CT. The PE protocol chest CT number was around 400, 450, so this is two and a half times greater than that, and why is that the case? Right, so the, here's a business shield in place that's put in place meant to reduce the dose to the breast, but we shouldn't tope the patient with that in place, especially in these modern scanners that are gonna adjust our MAS or our KV selection based on the density that they see when we do the topogram. So now the scanner sees that bismuth shield in place. It doesn't realize that that's what's there. It cranks up the parameters very high and we end up with a, do, uh, a, uh, a study that had the exact opposite of what we wanted to try and achieve by putting the bismuth shield in place. Okay. Th thanks everyone, and I'll hang around a little bit if there are any questions. <laughs>